Our second scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 10, beginning at the first verse. In Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called. He was a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. One afternoon, at about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. He stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? He answered, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner whose house is by the seaside. When the angel who spoke to him had left, he called two of his slaves and a devout soldier from the ranks of those who served him. And after telling them everything, he sent them to Joppa. About noon the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heaven opened and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. The, then he heard a voice saying, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice said it to him again a second time, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, and the thing was suddenly taken up to heaven. Now, while Peter was greatly puzzled about what to make of the vision that he had seen, suddenly the men sent by Cornelius appeared, and they were asking for Simon's house and were standing by the gate. Well, much later, at a dinner party, Peter began to speak to those who had gathered, and he said this, I truly understand now that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. The word of the Lord. Well, I've learned through the years that to receive a dinner invitation means that things are getting serious. Acquaintances meet for coffee, but when someone invites you to dinner, it means they want to see if you might could be good friends. A guy invites you to lunch, and it means he wants to get to know you. But he invites you to dinner, and it means he might want to develop a relationship. Well, an employer asks you to the office for a first-round interview, but when they're interested in hiring you, they host you for dinner. Throughout history, warring tribes have gotten serious about talking peace, and when they're ready to make a peace deal, they come to the dinner table. Why? because it's hard to wield a sword and eat. People allow themselves to be vulnerable when they sit down to eat, physically and otherwise. So the dinner table is the perfect place to figure out, do I trust this person enough to make an alliance with their tribe? Does this person have what it takes to get the job done? Do I like this person enough to share the most significant parts of myself with them? I have the privilege of facilitating several small groups and Bible studies throughout the week in my town in Charlotte, but one of them I particularly enjoy because it's for my peers. It's for women who are between 25 and 35 years old, young professionals who work very hard day in and day out, they're very smart, and they feel a lot of pressure to have it all together and to get things just right all the time. So at first we met in my office at the church and the group was nice, it was polite, and people talked about their jobs or how people in the scripture related to each other. But after six months, I still felt like I barely knew these people. So I asked, how do you feel about taking turns hosting the group for dinner and having conversations in our homes? The group thought about it a little bit. They didn't know each other very well either. They finally said, okay. And after that, everything changed. 
We went to Erin's house and we saw photos of her boyfriend. And she told us about how he had lost his first wife to cancer when they were just 30. And how he hosts a fundraiser every year in her honor and in support of cancer research. We marveled at his response to this horrific loss. And Aaron got honest about the fact that it was so hard for them to fathom that there could really be a good God active in their lives and who cared about them if this God hadn't saved this other woman from dying of cancer at such a young age. Well, another week, we went to Lindsay's and met her husband, who was warm and hospitable and clearly loved our friend beyond measure, and we were happy about that. But later, Lindsay talked about how much she'd like to share the experience of faith with her husband, but that he just couldn't bring himself to be part of a church, because all the churches he had been a part of as a child had too many requirements for who was acceptable or who could be saved. Well, social scientists have determined that of my peer group of millennials in the United States of America, of all of us who grew up in the mainline Protestant church, like this one, like mine at home, more than 50% of us have left the church altogether. Altogether. They will return to their parents' dinner tables, but they won't come back to this one. Why? One of the most comprehensive studies of religion and public life in America finds that it's not because they're atheists. It's not because they don't believe in God. It's not because they don't pray, they do. But they're also people who have grown up online and use phones as their primary way of relating in the world. They're intimately acquainted with the suffering of both their local neighbors and those around the world, billions of people they don't know how to care for. They've seen the culture struggle to redefine the boundaries of human sexuality. And they've been raised on Americana rock music and dance beats. And they've rarely heard or seen a church publicly address or live in the realities of these defining realities of their lives. So they wonder if Christianity and the way of Jesus are products of a bygone era or if it is a faith that they can access and practice within the realities of their lives. Every week, a millennial longing for spiritual friendships and spiritual guidance will invite me to coffee and ask me this. In all of my 21st century trappings as a young adult with my questions and my struggles, can I really be part of a Christian church? They really don't know. In our story for Max today, we meet a man who had probably wrestled with very similar spiritual struggles. Cornelius was a Roman centurion, a capable soldier, who had been promoted to the rank of commander, responsible for at least a hundred other men, and stationed in a most prominent seaport. This port was where the Roman governor probably summered, because it was breezy and it was beautiful, it was by the sea was also situated along important trade routes. So Rome needed that place to be safe and vibrant to keep their economy moving. So Rome sent soldiers like Cornelius there to make sure the local people remembered who was in charge and to keep the peace. So Cornelius was an Italian sent to enforce the Roman military occupation of Jewish Palestine. It's likely that Cornelius's local neighbors weren't too happy he was there. Let's just put it that way. But Luke, the author of the book of Acts, tells us that Cornelius was more than just his job title as a military commander and as a foreigner. He was a devout man who feared God and led his household to fear God. And as evidence of that, he was a generous man, giving alms to whoever asked, and he prayed constantly. There's evidence that in the ancient world, non-Jewish people could sort of tag along to the edges of Jewish communities, learn the teachings of the law, pick up the practices of the faith, and get to know God that way. But there was a lot of variation in the degree to which a non-Jewish God-fearer could be included in the Jewish community. Some people thought that men had to be circumcised and keep Jewish law in order to be really a Jew. 
others saw it as almost impossible to become Jewish if you weren't born into the faith. At any rate, for many, the divide between the truly Jewish and everyone else was very clear. And I'm confident that as devout as Cornelius was, he was not in. Well, Simon Peter, the apostle, understood this divide well. One day, he was in Joppa, another town along the coast, and went up to his rooftop to pray. He was hungry, and as he was waiting on dinner to be prepared, he fell into a trance. And he saw this vision of a white sheet being laid down with all kinds of four-footed reptiles and animals and birds on it. And Peter heard this voice calling out to him, Peter, eat, this is your feast, it is prepared for you. But Peter, being a good observant Jew, said, Lord, by no means I wouldn't dare eat what the law says is unclean. For thousands of years, the people of God have been very clear about how one is supposed to behave in order to be in good standing with God, and this would not be it. But the voice came again and again, finally saying, do not call anything unclean that I have called clean and good. Well, a few days earlier, Cornelius, too, had been praying at three o'clock in the afternoon, Luke says very specifically, and that was the time that observant Jews came out to pray throughout the city. And while he was praying, he received a vision and heard the voice of God saying to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before me. God blessed Cornelius. Send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon Peter. It's very hard to communicate just how extraordinary of a revolution this would have been. Try to picture, just for a moment, the person you think would least likely have a place in your church community. Maybe it's someone whose behavior is wildly offensive. Maybe it's someone who comes from another cultural group. Maybe it's someone who doesn't believe what the church has taught for thousands of years. Maybe it's someone who doesn't really like organ music. Well, now imagine God visiting that person at home, catching them mid-prayer and saying, with you, I am well pleased. Send someone to Howard Memorial to find an upstanding elder and invite her to dinner. She needs to meet you, and you need to hear what she has to say. Well, Cornelius sends men to find Peter. They tell him what has happened and invite him to dinner. And Peter started to say, thank you, but I, a Jew, I just cannot eat with Gentiles. It's just been that way for thousands of years. To eat dinner with someone, it's a very serious thing. It's like becoming one with them, becoming family, and I just can't be family with someone who... But then the white blanket flashed before his eyes, and he heard the voice of God calling again, saying, do not call unclean what I have called blessed, beloved. So Peter went. Meanwhile, Cornelius starts planning a dinner party and invites everyone he knows. You say, guess who's coming to dinner? Who? Simon Peter. Who? A Jewish man sent by God with a good word to share. I can only imagine that Cornelius's non-Jewish friends and neighbors and colleagues were saying, ugh. One of those super religious people, he's not even allowed to eat with us. They don't mix and mingle with people like us. We don't need to hear any more about this God who isn't accepting of anyone like us, anyone who doesn't follow those ancient rules of theirs. But Cornelius was very persuasive. And his friends thought, it's a dinner invitation. He's serious. Well, Simon Peter knew that he was serious too, and on his way, he thought hard about what he'd say when he got there, what word he'd share with this person who was clearly serious about his relationship with God. Where would he start? Explain the Apostles' Creed, maybe? Teach an old hymn? Tell him how upstanding Presbyterians dress to come to church? What do you start with? Well, Peter thought back about the very beginnings of the Jewish people. Why had God initiated a relationship with them in the first place? What were they called to do? Well, to make God's 
to make God known to all the peoples of the earth. That was it. That was the whole reason that God had initiated a relationship with them. It wasn't to cloister off one group from the others. It wasn't to make sure that everyone around the world became Jewish. It was to help the people of the earth know the creator God who delights in each and every single creature and invite them into this mutual delight and respect for the sacred. When Cornelius and his neighbors and soldiers and family were finally gathered around the dinner table, and the moment had come for Peter to stand up and speak, I wonder if a few of the soldiers muttered to each other, here we go, can't wait to be told what to believe and how to behave, and I can't possibly be acceptable to the creator God of the universe. But Peter, almost apologetically, said, I now truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message that he sent to the people of Israel, preaching, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. I can kind of see the dinner table scene. Furrowed brows raised in surprise, tensed up shoulders easing down, and people sitting back in their chair thinking, well, maybe there is something to talk about after all. Because some of them probably had heard this message of Jesus Christ, that the kingdom of God is like a great banquet to which the host had at first invited just a few of the usual suspects. But when not many people came to dinner, the same host sent out a servant saying, invite all who look like they need a square meal. All the misfits and all the homeless and all the wretched you can lay eyes on and bring them here. So the servant went out and the people came. But the host looked around again and said, you know, there's still room here. There's still room here. Go back out. Go out even further out of town and invite the people from the next town over and the people who spend all day working in the fields. Go even to those people who don't speak the same language you do and invite them in. I want my house full. This is the great banquet of the heavens on earth. That was the message of peace that Jesus had preached and the mission of the church that formed in the days following his resurrection. It was bold, it was messy, and it was way more about helping people to know God and God's blessing than teaching people how to articulate precise theological creeds or love a particular kind of music. Sometimes my vision, sometimes maybe our visions, and understandings of our lives as Christian people get too small. We confine our call to our relationship with our church or measure our mission by how well we do the things our parents did. But the Apostle Paul wrote to the earliest church in Corinth, and he said, your call is this, servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. It's an image and a call that I hope you'll embrace for yourself as we celebrate communion this morning. I invite you when you come forward to meditate on what it might mean for you to be a servant of Christ this week. And then after you've tasted the bread and the juice, I invite you to return to your seats imagining what it might mean for you to be a steward of the mysteries of God in your life. The creator of the universe has issued us a dinner invitation, and it's more than a kind gesture. It's a serious extension of divine trust and acceptance. So this morning, I hope that you will know deep in your soul that the God of the universe loves you, blesses you, and trusts you to extend that love and that blessing every single person you can find. All thanks be to God.